Hi, so I haven't made a video in a little while, so I thought I'd tell you a story today about some personal chemistry which has had a really massive and dramatic influence on my life. So I'm going to show you a photograph first of all of me and my partner Sam, and you'll learn quite a few things about me by looking at this photo. The first thing you can obviously tell is that I'm gay. The main reason you can tell that is who else would seriously wear purple shoes to their own partnership ceremony. The second reason you can work out this was taken on our civil partnership here in the UK is that the closest we could get to York Minster was sitting on the steps outside uh, and then we went off and got our partnership ceremony somewhere else. But there's a few things that you can't see in this photograph, a couple of things about Sam in particular that aren't so obvious. Here's an x-ray of some lungs and this is the kind of lungs that Sam has because he has cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder that causes progressive lung damage. Um, what happens is you're unable to balance the chloride ions in your lungs and that causes to a buildup of mucus around the cells of the lungs. The mucus effectively catches bacteria, you get bacterial growth, bacterial infection, fungal infection and repeated infections cause damage to the lungs. And eventually the damage to the lungs leads to early death of cystic fibrosis patients and the life expectancy of a patient with cystic fibrosis is in the UK currently about 37 years. So it was exactly a year ago today that Sam got to the point where he was really too ill to carry on with cystic fibrosis. Um, this is a picture of Sam taken around the time. He was on oxygen 24 hours a day at this stage and his lung function had declined to about 16% of its normal function. And at that point, they recommended that he very seriously consider a transplant, a double lung transplant, to replace the damaged and unhealthy lungs with cystic fibrosis. So in November of 2010, Sam was listed for transplant up in Newcastle at the Freeman Hospital, and we had only a short wait until a pair of lungs became available. In fact, in January 2011, Sam was transplanted. That was our third visit to the hospital. The first two transplants didn't go ahead and the third pair of lungs was good enough to transplant and the transplant went ahead. I'll tell you a little bit later more about how that went. And the story that I want to tell you about today is transplantation and in particular the chemistry of transplantation. It's very tempting to think of a transplant as being a medical marvel. The surgeons, there is no doubt, the surgeons are geniuses, the way they manage to make a transplant work. However, without some incredibly smart chemistry, which underpins the process of transplant, it simply wouldn't be possible. Early attempts at transplantation failed, and the primary reason that transplants are rejected is because the body rejects the organs. We have an immune system which is designed to recognise what is ours and what is foreign. And if you transplant somebody else's organs into your body, the body views them as foreign and it's unable to cope with them. It sends out an immune response against those organs and they'll be rejected. In the absence of any other treatment, simply transplanting the organs in, they are rejected within a period of hours. And this was a problem that plagued early transplantations. And the early transplant doctors were really in all sorts of doubt that the process of transplant was ever going to be possible at all. So the secret to successful transplantation lies in chemistry. What you need are effective drugs which can suppress the immune system of the patient. So what are the key drugs in transplantation? What are their molecular structures? and where do they come from? So the earliest drugs which were found to help with transplantation were steroid based drugs. It was known since about the 30s or 40s that steroids could suppress immune response. If you think about a cortisone cream which you would put onto a sting or a rash to reduce the inflammation and swelling which is caused by your body's immune system responding to what you've been in contact with. Well you can use steroid drugs in very high dose to try and suppress the entire immune system. And prednisolone is the drug of choice for this. And you're looking here at the structure of prednisolone, you'll see it's a fairly standard steroid based structure. Those three six-membered rings fused to one another and a five-membered ring on the right hand side. 
In this case, prednisolone has a conjugated ketone down in the bottom left-hand corner and an alcohol up in the top right-hand corner. It's a very effective drug at high dose for suppressing the immune system. And so the first transplant uh, surgeons tried to use this to suppress the immune response. And they found that post-transplantation, the organs would last a little bit longer before rejection took place. But this drug on its own was not enough to allow transplantation. The next drug that came along was a more designed drug, and it was azathioprine. And you're looking here again at the structure of azathioprine. It's a very interesting drug. The part of the structure that's now circled in pink is from a DNA base type structure. It's the kind of base that you would find in DNA. And you can look for comparison at the structure of one of the DNA bases and you can see the similarities that are there. In the top left hand corner of azathioprine is the nitro aromatic and it's connected to the DNA base through a thioether linkage. That part of the molecule is designed to fall off in the body, releases a free thiol, and that interferes with the processes of DNA in the body. And what it actually does is it kills rapidly reproducing cells. Rapidly reproducing cells are generating DNA very quickly, and if this molecule is around, it gets involved in the process and the cells die, because they can't use this building block for the synthesis of normal DNA. The cells in the immune system are some of your most rapidly reproducing cells in the body because once your immune system is kicked into action, lots of immune cells are synthesized and so if they can't create the DNA effectively, then the ability of the immune system to respond is knocked down a notch. And this drug, which came on stream in the 1960s, significantly enhanced the outcomes of the early transplant experiments. But still, it wasn't enough to allow transplantation to safely take place in humans without rejection occurring. The drug that led to the breakthrough in transplantation was isolated from spores, from fungus. It's a chemical natural product isolated from a fungus. And the structure of that compound is shown here. As you can see, it's a cyclic peptide with relatively large molecular weight and a number of distinctive side chains on the ring. This compound, cyclosporin, so named because it's cyclic, hence cyclo, and sporin because it comes from the spores of a fungus. This compound inhibits a very important enzyme within your immune system, essentially shutting down the immune system. So how does cyclosporin actually work? Well, the immune chemistry is incredibly complex. Here's an image of it. I don't want you to get too worried about it. Think of it as being like a massive transport network. If you're from the UK, think of it as being like British Railways. If you're from the States, think of it as being like the airway system in the States. And in this box, in the bottom left-hand corner, are a whole load of key processors. It's the hub of the network. It's like Birmingham New Street on British Rail. It's like Chicago in the American airport system. If you can take out that box, you can shut down the transport network. You can shut down the immune system. It's like the signals failing at Birmingham New Street or the air traffic controllers going on strike in Chicago. And that's what cyclosporin does. It binds to calcineurin, which is one of the key enzymes in that box, and it stops that part of the immune system from working properly. Now that sounds incredibly complicated, but it happens through a very understandable process. Fisher's lock and key hypothesis. In 1892, Emil Fisher said a chemical molecule interacts with a biological molecule like a key going into a lock. And cyclosporin interacting with calcineurin is no different to that. Here is a crystal structure which shows calcineurin interacting with cyclosporin. You can see cyclosporin is the small chemical molecule depicted in purple in this diagram. You can see its ring-like structure and it's interacting within the complex biological pocket, the active site of the calcineurin enzyme, switching it off and inhibiting the immune system of the patient. It's the combination of these three drugs that effectively depresses the immune system of the patient. Prednisolone, 
azathioprine and cyclosporine, those three drugs taken together, allowed transplantation to take place safely and it led to Christian Barnard's breakthrough of the first really successful human transplant. Now, I'm not saying that surgeons don't have an incredible input. Without a surgeon, a transplant can't take place. But to some extent, what the surgeon does is like what a plumber does. They have to take the relevant parts out from the patient, they have to put the new parts in, and they have to connect them all very precisely. But none of that would work without the chemistry to make sure that the connections don't go bad. And it's these three drugs that allow transplants to take place. So let's get back to Sam. How did his transplant go? Well, his transplant was very successful. Um, the lungs went in, and here's a picture of Sam uh, soon after his transplant had taken place. You'll see that he has a neckline in, which is taking lots of the drugs that he requires against rejection, also pain-killing drugs and a number of other drugs, taking them intravenously, because at this stage that's the easiest way to deliver the drugs to the patient. Well, what they do with SAN after the transplant in terms of the anti-rejection medications is they titrate the patient with the drugs. They measure key markers in the immune system, they add a certain amount of drug to the patient, and they see what effect it has on the immune system. And then they adjust the medication over a long period of time until you've got the perfect amount of anti-rejection medication. If you use too much, of course, the patient will get sick all the time from every bug that's going around. If you use too little, they'll reject the organs and ultimately die. So now Sam's back home. He's been back home for nine months or so. This is a picture of his typical daily medication, uh, some of which are vitamins and supplements, some of which are there because they keep him alive on a daily basis. To leave you with a happy image though, here's a recent picture of Sam taken just a couple of weeks ago. and. At this point, he has a lung function of 111%, so that's all the function and more than would be expected of a normal, healthy individual of his age. There's never any promises for the future, because the chemistry of transplantation is always in a fine balance between rejection and infection. But fundamentally, you only get a transplant when you have less than two years to live, often much less than that. And the ability of this operation and the chemistry behind it to extend people's lifespan is really a remarkable story of medicine and chemistry working together. So there's one final thing to say, and that's about organ donation. If you've not previously thought about being an organ donor, do. Here in the UK, it's on an opt-in basis. You have to choose to be an organ donor, and it really does save lives. More important than just signing the register or carrying the card is make sure your family know your wishes. What often happens when somebody unfortunately dies is the next of kin gets asked and even if the person who's died wanted to be an organ donor, the next of kin often says no and the doctors will usually listen to the next of kin even though you have a legal right as the organ donor having expressed your wishes. So do have an organ donor card, do sign the online register and do make sure your next of kin know if you want your organs to be used to save lives, because I can tell you it makes a massive difference. So now Sam's got 111% lungs, how's my life changed? Well, I can't keep up with him anymore, and he has an extra 11% to nag me with to do things around the house. So it's not all great, but overall it's absolutely fantastic, and I'm so grateful to the surgeons who did the work, and to the chemists who developed those drugs in the first place. Still love